Okay, so this is the second of the um, Earth Torah classes, and this one is going to be about fire. And it's the um, sacred flame, the Torah of fire. And it's part of the Pearlstone Online series. And you could go to pearlstonecenter.org slash online. And if you want to go to the collection of these um, at the time of this, re of this class, it's pearlstonecenter.org slash Torah. And you would be able to find the recordings of this and the links to each one of the classes. And we'll be giving one um, each week on Tuesday. Um, and we also have um, um, music and wilderness classes. There's a whole um, selection of offerings and you can check that out. Um, this class is particularly um, about fire. So the, the, the previous one was um, the Torah of Earth and now we're moving to fire. If we talked about the in the calendar, the um the f the the year is like a circle and it's divided up into four tekufa four periods and each period has um let's see um each period ha it, 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 in the um like here's the circle and it's divided into four tekufa so three months on each end the spring is the beginning of the earth. Uh, and then when you get to the top of the mountain, then, then comes the fire. So that image that we were talking about previously, I just want to make sure that we're just going to bring us back to that same image of the water. In the beginning, everything is cold, dark, and wet. And then fire emerges to bring forth a refuge or a rock or, or, or ground. Of, on which um, um, the Shekhinah, which is these two fluttering doves, can hold. And that one image of water all around with a rock and clouds on top is the image that um, is central to the story of Torah. So it's the first image that's being shown. And that image just keeps being shown over and over and over again. And it, like we talked about last time, like it's shown on, on Yerushalayim with the, with the cloud. It's showed in Har Sinai with the mountain and the, and the cloud. It's showed in Noah's Ark um, with the water all around and the mountain and the doves. It's the, it's the vision that you see when you're looking inside of the Mishkan because you see the Keruvim. It's the um, sort of the central thing of the body as well, where you have the mouth, which is like the fire, the thing that consumes. And then you have the body, which is where all the organs are, like the table and the lamp and the, the vessels. And then you have the lower region, which is like the Kodesh Kodesh and the Holy of Holies. That's like the place of, of love. So those three stages you see inside of, uh, inside of a body. That map, which is like the primordial map of what's going on, we, can, we perceive and conceive this idea not, because of, not just because of a tradition that's handed down of that, of that thing, but just there we are. We are living um, this creation. We're on a big rock amidst a big ocean with clouds on top. So it's being said over and over and over again. And it's why is, why is this life that we experience this way? And that's the question that we ask when we're perceiving Torah to find wisdom through um, looking at the way in which life is and the way in which the natural world is. The natural world being called in the Torah, the words of Hashem, the words of God, because the creator is the, the, is the imperceivable nothing behind all of this somethingness. And the somethingness are the words of the creator being manifested into a, um, a material existence. The, element and the idea of the most material and thickened aspect of creation is the rock and the most the thing that is burning behind everything is is the fire so um if there's questions put them into the chat and we'll respond and that's one of the advantages of having um this form of sort of interactive 
uh, <coughs> experiential <laughs> online experience. So please uh, feel free. So now I'm going to call us back to the source sheet, which can be found in that link. And for people, if, they're, if this is not live for you, then um, the link will be provided. So I'm going to go back to that central verse from Shira Shirin. And like we said in the previous class, that um, Shira Shirin, which is the love, the sort of the mystic, erotic poem that is in, in the Tanakh, that one was actually objected to by some of the um, people that were trying to codify what would be inside of the Tanakh. And when they objected to it, Rabbi Akiva said, if, that, if this work, if this Bible and this Tanakh is holy, you know, it, it's called holy, the Shir Shirim is called the Holy of Holies. So the idea of love and intimacy as the Holy of Holies is something that runs, and, sa and the, the, it's not just sacred, but the sacred of sacred, that runs through um, the entirety of the Torah. So the Kodesh Kedosh and the Mishkan is the place where the creation and the creator meet, and the Keruvim, which are in love, that's in that place, like the deepest place. So we're going to start again with Shir Shirim and see this verse being... Uh, uh, sort of chewed again. So let me be a seal upon your heart, like the seal upon your hand. For love is fierce as death, and passion is mighty as Sheol. Its darts are darts of fire, a blazing flame. Vast, uh, many waters can't put out this love, nor rivers drown it. And that quote, my Rabin, the yuchlu lechavos es ha'ava, that the the waters can't wash away the love. That is a message over and over and over again, that life continues to be sustained, and the love that gives refuge and gives place for us to find the meaning in our lives. This little um, path through the uh, through the split sea, that is created by the fire, that is created by the warmth. That fire is the love. So if you look at the verse, the passion and the love is being compared to fire, being compared to flame, and the whole existence of anything existing at all is this love. And that place, that love, is the love that, uh, that anything exists at all. So while there's many, my and Rabbi, many things going on, and there's, there's, a, a, there's a massive flood, Hello. There's a, a and 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 there's the particulars of the world that are 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 can be drowning. The love can't be burned out, and that love is compared to fire, and that love is the fact that anything is is existing at all, and that is that there is anything at all means that there's a communication from the unknown, that there's something here and it's saying something. So no matter what it's saying, even at the time of a great fire or a great flood, it, 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 the fact that anything is being communicated or anything is being held at all, that is like the place of Ahava Raba, which is the great love. And that is, a, uh, is part of Hitbonanut, which we talked about in the, actually the intro to all of these classes, the one that was called uh, um, Courage or the Torah of the Earth. Hitbonanut is to meditate on that. So one of, the, one of the places is just to meditate in that space of holding yourself in that anything is happening at all. That the fact that anything is happening at all is a great fire and a great passion and love. And that this, not, this experience is not a mundane experience, that, that it, can be, it can be taken for granted. But the fact that any structure is being held or anything is ha happening at all, that is a massive amount of love and energy and fire to make this happen, even though it seems so ordinary. But we're just fooled by the fact that we, you know, it seems monotonous because it happens every day. But it doesn't, won't happen for all our days, and our days are few. <laughs> so the, it, it really is a very passionate each each moment and each um, day that we're alive is full of passion. And then what this verse of this love not being able to be burned out is talking about. And Devarim, 
which is the verse, I'm going to say the source three in the sheet, is Ki Hashem Elokecha Eish Ochla Hu El Kana. So for the creator is a devouring fire, a passionate God. So in the Torah, um, many, 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 many times it says you didn't see a vision and that the God of the Jews is not something that can ever be perceived because the, the God of the Jews, wh- what does it mean to have a God? Uh, to have a God means that with which you think is worthy of worship, the thing that you think is worthy of worship. What do you think is worthy of worship? So if you think another person is worthy of worship, then you bend your knee to that person. They, you, you serve them right? If you think that love is worthy of worship, then you bend to, to, to um, human love. If you think that war is worthy of worship, then you bend to war and you serve war. But the idea of a Yehudi, the idea of the God of the Jews is the only thing that, um, that the Jews uh, felt was worthy of worship is the creator of all of this. Nothing is worthy of worship. Anything that shows up, is not worthy of worship. You bend your knee to nothing, ever. You only bend your knee to the thing that never shows up, the thing behind all this, the thing that you can never see and you can't identify at all. That you bend your knee because that's the thing that's speaking all of this. But what is this? What is all of this? These are the words and those words are very impassioned. They're not casual. Life is not like a casual, it could have been like a very boring casual thing. But the words and the creation of the world is a very passionate experience. Um, that's what the world is. It's full of flame and destruction and, and creation and movement. And that, the fact that it's like that at all for us, the, the thing that we're given, the experience of the world, is that the creator is a, is a devouring fire and an impassioned God. Is not a, a light one, uh, uh, eh, not that feeling, but one, it, it has a tremendous passion to it. Um, I'm going to put the link here just in case. So, we have the concepts of passion, we have the concepts of, of that it's not just a mundane experience, and we have this idea of both creative and destructive. Um, whatever is the thing behind all of this world is, is both of that. The other interesting thing about fire is the Torah does um, give, make it its um, job to tell us where instruments came from, where language came from, where tools came from, where um, all sorts of things came from. And many people have um, also uh, in their um, like elder tradition have stories of where these things came from. But the Torah doesn't explain at all where fire comes from. Just doesn't care to tell us (laughs) that. It just seems to be that fire is just like obvious. And um, it came, it, we never got it. We always had it or something, but it doesn't feel the need to tell that story, seemingly. And it never describes um, uh, the creator as anything and always goes to say over and over again that you didn't see anything and it's fleeting and there's no image to it. But here in this only place where it ever says God is something, it says Ki Hashem, not Ki Eish, but Eish Achla, devouring fire. That's not to say that God is fire, but it's so strong of a description, and that fire, meditating on fire, can give you an idea of what's the source of all this, that it doesn't do any kilos or kilos, it's just boom, like total uh, creative license there. Those are the two... Um, f- the things that, that, that will, for fire, will come out first. So when a person does um, hit, hit bodhidut uh, and, and meditates on a fire, so you, you make a fire and you watch it, you can see that, it, that, it, it, that, uh, that the fire is vaporous, right? So it has, it's not that it, it has 
um, no shape. It's that it has every shape. It keeps just rolling and rolling and rolling and rolling. And in that sense, it's like you can't ever place it. So you can give it a description. You can kind of say, oh, it's this, but then it moves and it moves and it moves and it moves. It's the same, Torah is compared in the same way. So it, the concept of Torah is that you get wisdom, but it can never be put into stone, can never be finished because it's like a flame. It needs to be turned over and over and over again. It's constantly changing for you to actually have the guidance and the wisdom. It keeps needing to be addressed anew. And that's the concept of Chidushe Torah, that Torah needs to constantly be renewed literally every single time it's learned and never to be taken as like um, for granted or, or in, a, in, a, in, a, in a dogmatic sense. So we'll go to the next source. So if we understand that um, fire is energy and fire is love, and that's at the, at the, at the source of anything existing at all, just in, not in like some taking somebody's word for it, just to contemplate that that is happening. So what are the first words that the Creator says? Vayomer Elohim Yehior Vayehior, right? And the Creator said, let there be light. So, and, and he saw that the light was good, and, and okay, I'll keep reading. Vayar Elohim es ha'or kito, vayavda Elohim ben or, v'vein ha'choshech. And the Creator saw that the light was good and separated between light and darkness. This is Creator a separator all the time, separating everything. Vayikra Elohim, the maker of dualities. Vayikra Elohim, in order to unite them. Vayikra Elohim la'or yom l'choshech paralayla v'yar v'voker yom echad. So God created light, and that is day, darkness, that is night, and there was evening, and there was morning, but it was one day. So that's the core of the Creator, that wherever you see a duality, you unite it, you see that there is no duality, and then you see the mark or the stamp of, of the Creator. But before that, because that's what light does, light casts, um, uh, that's not what light does, I'm sorry, that's what fire does. Fire casts light and shadow immediately, it casts both. But the fact that, that fire is there, it, if you watch a fire, it sheds its light, illuminating and giving us meaning and being able to allow us to experience or see anything. In Kabbalah, the idea of light is you can only, you can only switch or with experience. So the or of something means the experience of something. When you see the light of a person, it's your, the experience of the person. When we say uh, in Torah, the or ain't self, the light of the infinite one or the light of the one that has no end, it means the experience of the one that has no end or the experience of the infinite. So the, in, 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 in any communication, the communication will cast light on something and it will also obscure the other things. So when someone, when someone wants to tell you about themselves and say, oh, this is me, blah, 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 and they say the story about themselves, it's not like <laughs> anyone's fault. By the very fact that you're telling a certain story and sharing things because you want to express yourself, the other things are not being expressed and they're turning into shadows. Not, it's impossible in this world not to have that. You can't talk from now until the day you die trying to express things about yourself and you'll still be creating light and shadows. You'll, you'll just continually try to divulge about yourself, and you'll continually not be able to divulge everything. And the choices that you make with the words and the story that you create will be... So with all communication, you have what brings clarity and then what obscures things. The, with, a, with fire, fire creates light. And then as you, when you watch a fire that you make, when you tend to fire, you can see it casting its light and then casting all these, these, these stark shadows. And that's the original split between light and darkness. But when you, we look at the Torah and it says, um, um, uh, it's a consuming flame, the thing behind this, the, the creator is like a consuming flame, then what would its first, what would this consuming flame's first words be? The first words of any consuming flame, which is let there be light. By the by, the the burning of the flame, it keeps saying over and over again, "Let there be light. Let there be light. Let there be light." Just in the metaphor, not in the metaphor of like 
a literal metaphor, but like a literary metaphor, but as you stare at a flame, you'll see it as a physical metaphor. And it's saying, let there be light, let there be light, let there be light, let there be light. And in this world and this experience, there's constantly, let there be light, let there be light, you hear that. And that's the first thing, the first thing it says. And that's the first thing the fire says, the first thing that the, that the creator says. And it's impassioned because it's that anything should be experienced at all. So that Havdalah between light and day is the thing that we mark at the end of Shabbat. So if Shabbat is the central day of Torah and the central day of the Jewish practice, this central teaching, the most important of all of the teachings, it's the mitzvah, which is Shabbos, which is rest. The idea that we are not creating anything, that we have a day where we honor that with not doing anything. And we realize that it's, 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 it's things moving through us, but we're not the source of creation. And we rest and we realize all of the greatness that happens from restraint and the greatness that happens from rest. So at the end of that day is what is called Havdalah, it's separation. And Havdalah separation is the ritual that we do with light. And we bring in Shabbat with Kabbalah Shabbat, but Havdalah is at the, at the end of Shabbat and moving into the, into the weekday. So I'm going to do source seven. And let me check if there's questions. Um, okay. So this is the Radak, which is a commentator on the Rashid on that same story. It says, according to Levi, after Shabbos, when the world sank into darkness as a result of the creator's withdrawing of the original light, as part of Adam's punishment for have going against the creator's command of not eating from the tree of knowledge. So not eating the, of the tree of what you think is good and bad, but only eating from the tree of life. But since when, once, the, the, once we move from trying to eat in a way that we're eating and we're producing and we're motivated by what brings life, but we then shift to what we think is good or bad. When that happens, the original light of the creator gets withdrawn. And Adam, in that state of alienation, and in that state of being withdrawn from um, like the state of walking with the creator, um, instead, instead of seizing it, its energy, so Adam was sad, and he said, is darkness to conceal me permanently? And the creator responded to his cry of anguish by replacing the original light with fire. <laughs> okay, so the Radak and the Midrash, there's no explanation of where fire comes from, because fire just comes from the creator. But the Midrash is giving a story of where it is, actually. It's like the Midrash is like the... Um, when you're making a movie and you have all these scenes that you shoot and then you cut <laughs> some of the scenes out, you throw it around you, and you say, this is the story. Well, the Midrash are those stories that didn't make it into the, into the cut. So this story that didn't make it into the cut on purpose, but um, so the replacement for that original light, meaning being able to experience everything in the state of life, is, is fire. So when you're choosing to work with the world in the state of what you think is good or bad, then the, instead of you lose your experience of being able to experience life as a walk with the creator, but now you have fire instead. So that's where the source of fire comes from, meaning this you wield, wield, wield the, wield actually works too, you wield the fire you wield the creative power. So if the fire is these, this communication that is saying that the world should exist, and if behind every material existence is what we could call information, and because it's perceivable and it's um, understandable, and we can understand it, so that means there's information behind it that we're perceiving, that information is, is, is like letters of fire. 
energy um, information. So when you're not perceiving that, then you are working with fire. And so he taught him how to reduce fire by striking two rocks together. And when um, Adam was successful with it, he gave a blessing, meaning uh, like he honored and was thankful for the fire. So that's the Radak on Bereshit. The Midrash on Tehillim says, and some say that the Holy One Blessed, he prepared for him two stones. So this is, uh, this is the same oral story that is being passed down from that same time um, that didn't make it into the cut. This is another um, uh, source that's quoting that same story. And some say that the Holy One, blessed be he, prepared for him two stones. One thick darkness and one was the shadow, with the shadow of death. As one sets out on darkness, see out of the stones. So these two rocks. So what are the two rocks that are making fire? It's like the, the shadow of death and the, and the thick darkness. And Adam, the first, the first uh, um, um, early man, struck them together, and out came the two stones. Out of the two stones came fire. And Adam made Havdalah. He made a blessing. The one who divides from the holy and the profane. Therefore, we make Havdalah over fire as Shabbos ends. So this Midrash is saying that's the source for Havdalah, is, these, is a blessing over these two rocks, <laughs> right? It's the split of the fact that when you unite these two rocks, you bring these two these duality together, out, you know, then the fire emerges. So I'm going to quote this, this source. So uh, this is, again, this is Pirkei de, de Rabbi Eliezer. There's again, another source, also aware of this story and quoting it. So at the end of Shabbat, Ad Adam was me- meditating in his heart and saying, perhaps the snake which tricked me will come in the evening and he'll attack me in the heel. So a pillar of fire was sent to him to give illumination about him and to guard him from them. Adam saw the pillar of fire and he got happy. And so therefore he put his hands to the light of the fire and he said, blessed are you, Lord of the God, King of the universe, who creates the flames of fire. So that's in the ritual of of Adala, that's the fire, right? And when he removed his hands from the light of the fire, he said, now I know that the holy day has been separated from the other days. So there's, this is the idea of the sacred, right? That I make a moment that is visionary and I make a moment that is sacred and I make a moment that, a moment that is special. And this um, is the, is the um, also the stamp of the creator because the creator is always in those dualities. And so when I make a moment sacred and I, I make holiness at, to a certain moment, it, you can sometimes feel that if I make one thing holy, that means the other thing, which is being now not holy, is now bereft of holiness. But like we said in the previous class, there's the hachna'a, uh, hamdala, and hamtaka. So the hachna'a is the submission and surrender to what is. Habdallah is to make the separation, to bring the thing that is sacred to you, the thing that you want to be, the thing that you don't want to, right? Or any of these separations, light, darkness, this, that, blah, 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 all of this world of dualities, to make the separation. And the hachna'a is the sweetening. Sorry. The hamtaka is the sweetening, is the kiss, is when they come together. So... It's not that um, the duality makes the other thing unholy. It's that you make it holy, and this one, it, it, you make the split, and then you bring them together. And that unity of that duality is the thing that it makes the entirety of it holy. And that goes back to the first um, words, which is, let there be light, and there was day, and there was night, one day. There wasn't day and night, two different things. It's a one, it's a, it's a unit. 
the thing that is in and the thing that is out, the exterior world and your interior world, your body and your soul, right? So it's not that, um, that you shouldn't make that duality. It's that you make the duality and then you transcend it. So you, 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 you talk in a way that there's a soul and a body and then you realize that's all garbage, that's totally not true. There's no soul and body. <laughs> it's one thing. But you, you first divide it to be able to unite it. And that is the ritual of Havdalah, which all the whole ritual of Havdalah is the celebration of this fire. So, and the honoring and the sacredness of, 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 of the fire. So, um, if those, if there's, if you're on or you're listening to this and not familiar with the ritual of Havdalah, I don't want to go through the entire thing, but after Shabbat, you make the blessing to make it holy. After Shabbat, you make the blessing, you make that moment holy, and then you bless the fire, the smell, and the spices, um, and, and that's the ritual, the fire, the smell. Um, well, you, the Kiddush cup, you make the blessing on the wine, and then the fire, then the um, Kiddush cup, spices, fire, and then you drink the wine afterwards. But if you just want to take that out and like clean it from the, the function of the ritual, it's basically the, um, the fire. So Rabbi Mana says, how must a man say Havdalah blessing over a cup of wine with the light of a fire? He says, blessed are you, uh, God, the creator, who creates various flames of fire. And when he removes his hands from the fire, he says, blessed are you who divides the holy from the profane. Right? So in, in Havdalah, you have the blessing of the fire, and then you say the blessing between, and you make all these dualities, right? And it, which is the, the blessing of the holy and the profane. So why does that show up? Or like, why is that so important at that moment? Is because that's what fire does, right? The fire creates light and shadow in one shot. And it's not like it creates light and then shadow. It's just light and shadow. And they're one thing, and the expression of the, of the creator the light and the darkness of this world. So then, this is a really interesting Pirkei Eliezer. If he has no wine, or she, put, uh, he puts forth his hands towards the light of the lamp and looks at his nails, with, which are whiter than his body. And he said, Blessed are you who divides the holy from the ordinary. And when he has removed his hands from fire, he says, Blessed are you who divides the holy from the ordinary. Now, this is the next law, the next halacha. If he has no fire and he puts forth his hands into the light of the stars, which are also fire. So he's saying that it's like the original fire. Like if you don't have a flame, you can actually do Hadala by the light of the stars. And the stars are that fire on, on uh, like the background of darkness. And then you say, blessed are you the, who creates the various flames of fire. And if the, this is such a beautiful line, if, what if the heavens are dark in that night, right? He has no fire and the skies are dark, the clouds are covering up. Then he lifts up the stone and he said, blessed are you who divides the ordinary from the, the holy from the ordinary. So this like flint and the stone, he splits it. It's good to see you. So, um, what we what we just got up to now, and this is this where um, class is usually set for like an hour to an hour and a half. Um, usually, probably will be an hour and a half. So, all right. So, what was that uh, sources? So that particularly we're talking about light and darkness as being the very first um, thing that we perceive when we look into creation, that creation is constantly saying, let there be light. That's the most primal communication. And light means let there be experience and let there be things that we don't experience and that we don't know. Let there be awareness and let there be non-awareness. Let there be um, uh, things that we understand and seem good and let there be things that we can't understand that don't seem good. Let there be uh, refuge and let there be life that, that, that 
crawls out onto the rock and, and celebrates and then let, let it go away. So these dualities of both like of giving communication and giving experience and giving refuge and taking it away, that's like at the most central communication of when you just perceive what is this life about and what's going on in there. It's that sort of back and forth of giving and taking away. So um, let me look to see. So David says that in meditation, when he surrenders to, to that force, he can feel that going up and down, right? And that is also the key, uh, a key of life, right? That there's just these constant up and downs. And the, basically the, um, the one that represents uh, the ability to weather the up and downs is the moon. Because the moon knows, it, it, the moon goes through periods. So it, it gets full and then it gets small and it gets full and it gets small. So the moon knows that it's cycles. It knows that when you're going through a rough spot, it's just to come up. It's just to come up. And so the moon can fall knowing that it will get up again. As opposed to the sun that if it falls, it just, you know it may never come back again. So it's more afraid of that. Um, so let's see if we should go to the next source. Um, yeah. So that was source nine. And now we'll go to 10, which is who's fire on the source sheet. Oh, let me paste that in if anyone came. So Rachel says that women are very tuned to the cycles within nature. Right, um, uh, especially because of uh, that exact back and forth of light and darkness, of, being, of understanding the fall as part of the process. That is something that if you're um, a person that is walking around in this life with a female body, you you get a experiential teaching of wisdom that is embedded into your body of that. While me, um, people that are walking around in a male body, they, they don't experience that. They don't experience the life and death cycle within them. And obviously, I keep saying, oh, it's not, it's, your human name is not Rachel. Okay. So, uh, Rochelle. So, that as it, as it moves, as, the, as it moves uh, within you, you learn that lesson. And having a male body, I know that uh, I, it, it took me a while to, I didn't learn that automatically. Um, it, it wasn't a teaching that was given to me by my body. Um, it was a teaching given to me by life because all of life is constantly teaching us that, right? Night and day and this and that. And, uh, and every day you have your ups, ups and downs. But it's not an embodied uh, wisdom. So um, we actually say that um, there's the Adam and Chava, which are the, the primordial early man, is referred to as Ish and Isha. And in Hebrew, it's Aleph and Shin and Aleph and Shin. So Aleph and Shin means fire. And the word for man is there's different. Adam means earth thing because Adam is Adama. So earth and soil and clay, really the red clay is because uh, Israel is, has that, those, those, that, uh, that type of clay, that brownish red. And Adam, which is Adam, is, means uh, the translation would be earthling, one who's made out of clay. It's a little clayling, a little earthling. The, and that's the relationship with Adam and Adama. The other word for um, human is and that actually is Adama, is human, like humus or whatever, but is Ish, is Ish. Ish means man, is Aleph Yud Shin. But the word for woman is Isha. It's the same two letters, Aleph Shin, the same fire, but it's fire Ah. 
and the man is a fire with a e inside there. It's a little line is for the man and a uh, uh, shape like this uh, is the hay for a woman. The two letters that are making the difference between male and female is yud hay. So you see the creator splitting and making the difference between masculine and feminine parts is it's the creator that's doing it. It's the yud hay, the ya. I don't. It, it, um, I don't know if the that comes through. In um, if if it's if you don't know Hebrew letters, but basically that the, it's a Y and an H that is inserted into these two fires to make them different, and the spelling for that is Yah, and Yah is the name of the Creator. So if the Creator is bringing the world ins, into existence by going Yah, it creates a duality between masculine and feminine energies just by existing in the flame. So there's these two flames that are like playing with each other, which are like the, the doves. And the one who has made the difference between them is the name of God inside of fire. And that's like where um, humanity is called the firelings, right? So we're either the earthlings, but when you're referring to Ish and Isha, you're actually saying the firelings, these little firelings, the ones that are wielding fire, the ones that are, that are full of love and passion and are wielding creative and destructive forces. And that's the, the concept of humanity as Ish and Isha. It's split in, in, in their nature with masculine and feminine, as opposed to Adam, who's actually male and female. And the, the marriage is between Adam and Adama. The Ish and Isha are split between masculine and feminine energy, always um, going like this with each other. And wielding fire, the creative uh, element of fire and the destructive element of fire. And you see that human beings are very, in, in that sense, passionate in the fact that we are the ones that um, have the most empathy uh, for other beings and also the most destructive and hatred right so you don't see all these other animals running around caring for other animals in that sense not there are animals that care for other animals and especially their own but the, you don't see this massive care that comes out from humanity and that's creative and destruction the love that we have to connect with everything that we see then we end up messing around with everything we see. And so it's this duality of whether we're helping or we're hurting, whether we're destructive or we're creative. And, and there's no rule for that because acting one way in one place with one being is, cre is creative and acting that exact same place with another being is destructive or, or with the same being in a different place, it's destructive. So it's not a, it's, it's hard for the human being once they see once they're seizing fire, and they're cr trying to create out of this great love to wield the power, and that power of fire is the words of the creator, meaning creative energy to change the world. Right when people say, "I want to change the world," <laughs> like why would you want to change the world? It's good, right? But that it's the, oh, I want to change it. Well, you, you want to change it for good or, or, or bad? Or what is good? What is bad? Are you changing it for the sake of life? What is, the, what is your energy? Are you wielding the creator's words or are you just, um, you're, or you're just inflamed and, uh, and on fire? And the, the, this energy of both being a fireling, which is Isha Nisha, and an earthling, is like that duality in itself as well. So us as, as firelings, Ish and Isha, that is like the soul, the energy within us. And the Adam and Adama is the thing that is the material, is the rock. We're like, the, that is in our, in, in our rock beings as earthlings, the, the way we show up in the most material sense. And it's actually, that's the... Um, uh, like we said in the first uh, class, the, uh, the description of the creator says, you're like, um, uh, you're like clay in the hands of the potter. 
So that's actually what happens in gray sheets, right? The creative takes a, um, clay, molds it into a little earthling, which is actually like a little figure, a little clay figure, and then blows the breath of the creator into it. And what's the breath of the creator? The breath of the creator is fire, right? And so what happens when you, when you cook uh, earth? It's like clay, like you're making a, like you're making a pot. And that is the, the letters of the creator are being blown into this little earthling. And the fire is that information. And, what, and it goes into our breath. And so all of a sudden we have this power, which is the power of fire that is in our breath. And what's the power of fire that's in our breath? Well, if the thing that is behind creation is information, and it's like the energy that is powering the world to bring it into existence, that's like the letters of fire. So the breath of the creator that went into us is our ability to use letters, right? These fiery letters of information are actually are uh, the thing with which we create the most and we're the most destructive. So right now human beings can calculate with, with letter and number like the, um, you know, some distant star and tell you that the, on that moon is full of diamonds. It's like a sea of diamonds because of being able to, with, with letter and number, to be able to calculate that. And that's with the, this power. With, and once you wield that kind of power of being able to speak the information behind creation, you all of a sudden own it in the sense you can manipulate it. And when you can manipulate with language, that's like the, 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 the fire of which the world is created is actually in your mouth, it's in your breath. And that's the, the concept of the, the power of words that they can create and destroy, right? So like, I'm not gonna do it, sometimes I do it if I'm talking like this, but if I said something, very, I, I can't do it right now because it's uh, such a tender moment at the, this exact moment. But if I all of a sudden said something really like hateful or dismissive to everyone, even if you knew that I, I said, listen, I'm about to do that, I don't really mean it, <laughs> I don't mean it, I, I love you all, but just as an example, I'm gonna say something, and then I would say it, no matter what, it would hurt, and actually it would leave a residue, the power of those words. And even if you, just the, 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 the fire of those words, and that's where the, the concept of everything that you say having power, but the information is even more important, right? That what is implied by those words and what can be contained in those words are the things that um, can allow us to manipulate um, the world. So that same fire that is inside of us that we're using either for creative or destructive purposes, that's the same sort of fire that the uh, of the creator behind the world. Let's see if we can we'll go to the next. Okay, so now source 11, Sota. Um, so Rabbi Chama, son of Hanina, further said, what does it mean by this text that you shall walk after the um, God, the creator? Is it possible for a human being to walk after the Shekhinah? The Shekhinah is the feminine presence of the creator. For who, uh, the cloud, just to say. For has it not been said that the creator is a... Um, consuming fire, a devouring fire. How can you, you can't be, you can't walk after, says Rabbi Chama. It says rather you should follow its traits, right? So what does, the, the very concept of Torah is to s stare into creation and the natural world, hear its ways in which it moves, learn the wisdom and guidance for your life. And that's what he's saying. So number 12. So a messenger of the creator appeared to him in a blazing fire out of the bush. And he gazed and there was a bush all aflame and yet the bush was not consumed. So that is the, the moment for Moshe, for Moses, when the, he first sees the creator. And of course, it's in a flame, right? Of course, it's the tree, like the tree of life. 
all flame not being consumed because the fire of the creator that is it burns but doesn't uh, doesn't extinguish and then next verse 13 and they came to the mountain the mountain was burning with fire in the heart of heaven with darkness and cloud and thick darkness right so there you see up on top of Harsinai you see this fire and a thick cloud of darkness again this same these are the sort of the stamp of that which is behind all of what life is, whatever this existence is, is this stamp of casting light and making shadows at the same time. And the creator spoke from, spoke to you out of, from midst the fire, and you heard the voice of words, and you saw no form, only a voice. That's the, that is the um, ultimate revelation for Jewish people, this staring at this mountain full of fire, casting light and shadow. And you don't see anything, but you hear a voice. And that's the, the concept of Torah, where you look at the world and what is happening, but instead of seeing something, your seeing becomes hearing. And actually inside of Harsina, it says that they saw the thunder and they heard the lightning, right? So information and hearing gets switched. So when you're looking at life, you're actually hearing words. You're hearing the wisdom in it and not just, um, oh, I, this is things. And if, and if someone talks to me, then I hear information. But I don't hear information <laughs> unless someone talks to me or I read it in a book. But actually, when I'm looking at life, I actually hear what it's saying. And that's, the, that's what prophecy is. Prophecy for a prophet means to be able to look at what's happening and to hear what the creator is saying by what it is saying that this should exist and this should happen. And this moment is important. So what is it saying? So like for instance, right now, everyone is being told to go inside. So that would be the most obvious thing. Right now is the time to go inside. What does going inside mean? Going inside to connect with the inner aspect of yourself, going inside to connect to those who you're huddled with. Going inside means, to, you know, so it's clear. You, you actually can hear the words through what is showing up. So this is the Midrash on this moment. And you find that when the Holy One gave the Torah, it was entirely of fire. As it said, at the Creator's right hand was a fiery law. And our sages said, and the law was fire, and the parchment was fire, and his writings was on fire. As it is said, and God's right hand was a fiery law. And the face of Moshe upon, re upon receiving this revelation went in flames. And then his own face was casting light all over the place. And they were afraid to come near. And the angels who descended at that moment were made of fire. As it says, who makes winds, these messengers, and the mountain burned with fire. That fire that is burning is like these messengers with a message from the creator. They're in the flames. The seraphim are the fiery angels, the ones that are made of fire. The ones that you can hear their message through the perception and through looking at, the, at, at flame. Like there's a specific Jewish meditation on Hanukkah to when you light the candles to sit with it for a half an hour and hear what the flames are saying. So the message and the wisdom that comes from the perception of that, but not being perceiving, like, let me look at what it looks like, let me hear what it's saying, that's like those messages. And for the creator is a devouring fire. And upon the earth, God made the, to, see the, uh, to see the creator's great fire. And the divine word was, came forth from midst the fire. And when they beheld the lightning and the burning letters, and the Holy One said, do not imagine that they have much power. And the creator began to recite the words, I am the creator, and you should have no other gods. And then the Ten Commandments um, above. So that's a description of that moment. And when it's describing the moment, it's all flame. The letters are flame, the parchment is flame, it says that the, it's black fire on, on white fire. So I've uh, shared there's a fine line between listening to the words and imposing your own words. Right. I know that, <laughs> that, uh, that place. 
Um, uh, right, and so that's always the issue with um, that transference of the visual to um, information. In other words, to hear what life is telling you. It always at that moment where it breaks through that lens, it's always going to the lens is you. So you're, it, as, as the message comes through, it has to come through you because the message is coming to you. So you're obviously, for you to take it as a message to you, it's going to have to filter through what you are. And when it does that, that's the danger of imposing a view right? Um, but it's almost, it has to happen. So this is the source 15. And the mountain was ablaze with fire to the very heart of heavens, darkness, cloud, and thick darkness. If you were to say that the beginning of this verse appears to contradict its end, seeing that if something burns and is a flame, then obviously there's no darkness there. The miracle at the time was that darkness and light coexisted. And this is like the wonder, i.e. the thing to see. That's what it means, the thing to see, the thing to observe. So Moses goes on to say that God spoke to you out of the fire. What you heard were the sounds of the voice. However, you had no vision of something by means of a picture or an illustration. The reason that you cannot see the vision, the picture, was that it was enveloped in different degrees of darkness. This had to be so because no one could get a visual of the essence of the creator. So, and that's because of its uh, sort of fiery uh, uh, shaking. So we have a thing that then, the, and that's why Moses was the ultimate prophet because he had no bias, right? So it says that there's, um, le, that Moshe had an aspeclaria that was clear and the other prophets had an, an aspeclaria that was bent. Aspeclaria is, is like a lens or a mirror. It depends how you want to look at it. Both are interesting to think of that. So Moses was completely clear as we like, so a perfectly solid mirror and he could see in the in the in reflection, i.e., look at what I, what I am and what life is around me, and see that in reflection mm -hmm. of what it means, and he could see it with clarity. And everyone else had a distortion in that mirror, or you could see it as looking through a lens, and the lens has like stuff on it, so it's not clear. And that actually, it says that the difference between those two, the aspeclaria that is closed in Aspeclaria that is um, occluded is that Moses always says, this, this is what it is. he has this phrase, but this is what it is, right? The rest of the prophets, they always say, and thus spoke God. They say, Koamar Hashem. It's a very bombastic language of the rest of the prophets in the Tanakh. And the way they talk is always extremely poetic and sort of, um, they have these vast visions of the things that they're seeing, they think apply for like ever and ever and ever. And they have this very like, and thus spoke the, the, what they hear at the moment is, is, is a massive thing. And Moshe actually is like, okay, this is, he always says, this is the thing. That's, it's actually the way he says it in, in Hebrew, but in English, he says like, it actually, this is the thing. Meaning like, all right, this is the thing right now. I'm just like, he has perfect clarity and without assuming anything moving forward, it can always change, but this is the thing. And that's the difference between an occluded mirror and a, um, uh, a clear one. But what is the thing that's being perceived? It's, I'm looking at the, the, uh, the world and the material expression of it and I'm perceiving and looking deeper into it, and I'm hearing those, I'm hearing what this linguistic expression is, I'm hearing what these words are saying. And those are, what is the energy that is pouring into this experience and making it happen and why? And therefore those are like called letters of fire because they're letters of um, energy. Okay. 
Now we're going to go to source uh, 17, which is creation and destruction. For in six days, the creator made heaven and earth and all that was in it, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the creator blessed Shabbos and made it holy. That's this idea that there's seven, uh, six days of creation, which is the entirety of the world, light and darkness, the three splits, light and darkness, sea and sky, earth and vegetation, those are the first three days, and then the beings that go into that, those realms. So the beings of light go into light and darkness, the stars and moon and, and the sun, the beings of the sea and the sky go into the second day, the birds and the fish, and the beings of the earth and the, uh, of the earth and the vegetation are, are people and animals, they go onto the land, onto that, onto that rock. Taken in its entirety that this is a continual, for some strange reason, the way the world exists, this is the constant of what life is, and it's resting, i.e., it's not in a state of change, but in a state of a circle, like a cycle. Like it's not asking to be derailed. It's asking actually to repeat continually, and it constantly is brought back into existing. So that is the idea that we're in this as players in this creation, and we're not the ones that are creating, but we're the ones that are surrendering to the creator we're the ones that are learning what the path is we're not the ones that are making the path even as we act so we have this day where we stop everything and we just enjoy things the way they are we experience what is without any desire to change it at all and that's the idea of shabbos which is the mitzvah it's like the the central mitzvah of the of the jews <clears throat> but what is the central it's it's what's funny about Shabbat is that it's all a bunch of no's. No, 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 no. The central no is, actually there's two central no's. There's one is moving something from one place to another movement, but the, at its, the, the above that is fire, not to light fire. And that's the one that's centralized in the, in the, in, 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 the, in the Tanakh, in the Torah. Why is that? Because, because that's the way in which creation is made, is through fire. So if fire is these letters that are forming the world, and it's the, the, the fire is what got breathed into the earthling, and the fire is, is, the, is those letters that are making all of creation, so fire is the thing that if you're saying, I'm not changing things, I'm accepting what is, and I'm not going to be seizing that power for myself, then this day I don't um, use fire, right? And that is making it holy. So um, does that, is that clear? Right? So like the ultimate expression is, is of Shabbat is the light. <laughs> is to not light a fire on Shabbat, is to not do something, right? The other days of the week, we are wielding that power, and the seventh, the seventh day, we're not, we're not doing something, and that's like the surrender is the greatest sort of action that one can do. So in um, Source 19, so the fire on the altar shall be kept burning and not to go out, and every morning the priest shall feed wood to it and lay out the burnt offering on it, and turn into smoke the fat parts of the offering. A perpetual fire shall be kept burning on the altar, and it should never go out. And so actually in history, the Jewish people had like a continual flame burning for 800-something years. And according to the Midrash, even when we went into exile, we brought that flame with us. And so we carried it along with us, possibly in a coal and continue to light. And that is in every single holy environment uh, for Jewish people is this flame, is this fire. So it shows up over and over and over again in many, many, many places. So um, it's in the Mishkan, in the central part of the Mishkan, right in the center, you have the fire. In the mountain, you have the fire. In the Beis Hamikdash, you have the fire. In every single synagogue, you have the Ne'er Tamid, which is the fire. In the Shabbat, which is like when the Jewish house emerges as sacred, like as sacred, um, holy place, 
And when it does, it has the Shabbat candles in, in the middle of it. And then when someone dies, you have a, you have a Yurtzeit candle, a, a candle that you light. And each one of these is, again, remembering that fire and keeping it burning. That fire is the fire that the Creator created the world with, that blew into our mouths in order to wield information to be able to create and destroy. And that is being like treasured and moved around from one place to another. Um, if you look at fire, it casts light and darkness, and then it creates a pillar of smoke, right? And in Hebrew, the pillar of smoke is called ashan, which is like a vapor. And not only is the, is, is the creator impossible to pin down, and can't get any, you can't say anything about it, but even the world is vaporous, right? When you say anything about it, the world is like this, the world is like that, people are like this, people are like that, this is always true, this is all, right. and you say all these platitudes, they always come in the words of the Creator, like Yahoo says that the words of the Creator constantly shatter the words of man. So man has words, and the Creator just shatters them. These words of fire break through any of the, uh, of the words that, that, um, that we use, because the world is like smoke. So just like the creator is impossible to pin down, the world is also constantly changing and vaporous. And that's what King Shlomo says that um, in Ecclesiastes, where he says the world is, I think in translation, they usually say, um, I don't know what, the, uh, that um, vanity of vanities is the translation, but the Hebrew is actually saying vaporous and vaporous. The world is all full, it's like smoke moving around. Um, it's impossible to grab a hold of, to 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 say this is this is exactly what it is, and that in Hebrew is Aleph Shin Nun, which is Olam Shana and Nefesh, which is what this entire experience is made out of. It's made out of these three elements. Olam is world, which means place. Shana is change, which is time. We don't have time or exist in time. It's, it's really the word for it is just changes. It's, it's, there's changes. And nefesh is soul, like beings. So these three things are what make up the entire experience of the world. And they actually spell out in Hebrew, ashan, smoke, like a pillar of smoke. And so in the same way that the source is constantly changing and can't be pinned down and constantly needs to be adjusted, the smoke is also the world and the soul and, and time these three elements constantly moving and um, dancing with each other may create a situation where you constantly have to turn back to Torah <clears throat> to get guidance. There, your guidance yesterday doesn't apply right now. It needs to be relearned and re-figured um, out today. Is it still true? Is, is, am, I, am I doing this today because I did it yesterday? Or am I doing it today because I need to be doing it today? And some things stay the same, and some situations are different. And to be able to hear the Torah is, means to be able to know how to act in each situation, to be able to hear the words, which are the, like the, the fiery letters behind creation, but to be in a state of Har Sinai, to be in the state of Mount Sinai, of receiving Torah at the moment that you turn for guidance, right? Not, oh, because of something I learned um, two years ago, but because is it, 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 am I hearing it? Um, am I hearing it right now? And ultimately, that um, um, ability to hear that is what is what uh, like hitbodadut and hitbonanut is. And um, now we're gonna go to the next source. So in 20, so the creator went by a pillar of cloud by day and to guide them along the way and a pillar of fire at night they got and, and gave them light and that they may travel during the day, right? So there you have the pillar of smoke, the sashan, which is that you get guidance from the fire and you get guidance from the smoke. Those are the, right? So you're getting guidance from the light and you're getting guidance from this like shifting uh, combination of world, soul, and time. 
And since we have only a certain amount of time, I want to make sure that we get to this part. So the first mitzvah um, is actually to create, to be fruitful and multiply. We'll talk about that mitzvah when we do the Torah of trees. But that idea of creation is what is the what is all of this life? What is the, is to be creative, right? The very existence of this world is an act of creativity. So what would I hear to myself if I would realize and look and say like something's existing? Ah, as treasuring creativity, treasuring the creative aspect, both physically, but not just physically, that we should be creative and, and to be alive and to live and give birth to life but also give birth to creative ideas, to learn more, to grow, to create things. And so that's the, uh, that's the first mitzvah in, uh, in, in Bereshit. But actually the first mitzvah that comes as a mitzvah is to watch the moon. <laughs> that's the first, watch the moon, watch her, and to, and to celebrate it. So the first mitzvah that it comes from the creator is watch the moon. And by watching the moon, you'll be able to watch the cycles of the calendar. The Jewish calendar is set according to the moon and it adjusts itself to the sun. And watching those months is like the first um, teaching. So if you watch the seasons, you watch the moon and you watch these calendrical um, processes, that's the, that's the first mitzvah. And so what is the first mitzvah in its, in its vision? So on this month, you should mark for you, and this is source 22, you should mark for you the beginning of the months, and it shall be the first of the months of the year for you. And that's this month. So right now, we're in Nisan, and this is the first month of the Jewish calendar. It's, it's Chodesh, the first one. It's the first moon, and it's the beginning of the year. So this is actually the new year. It begins in spring, and it begins at this exact, this is the first moon. She's the first one to be born of this year. And this is where the mitzvah, this mitzvah of you should mark the months is when the when coming out of Egypt, we got the first thing, it was the first month, and it was this month that she was blessed. That's the first mitzvah. So how how is that first mitzvah honored? So, source 23, if the judges didn't know the witness, others were sent to testify about it. And there's, what does it mean? That it can't, it's not done according to a calendar, it's done according to actually looking at the moon. You have to watch her. And when you see her, then you say, ah, the moon started again. Not, I have a calendar that says it's a new month. You're saying I have a new moon. Look, I saw the moon. So they have to go as witnesses. And it doesn't apply if it's not, if they weren't, they have to witness it. At first, the testimony about the new moon was received from anyone, but then there were all sorts of corrupt people that were bribing witnesses and da 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 Okay. At first, the bonfires were lighted on the top of the mountains. But then when the so the Kuthians <laughs> uh, corrupted the process and were lighting other fires. It was ordained that messengers should be sent out, like little Malachim. But what is that? So it's fire on the mountain. <laughs> That's what it is. So the first mitzvah of watching the moon is honored and inaugurated by lighting a fire on the mountain. <laughs> That's the. That's literally the mitzvah. So how are these mountain fires? lighted. They brought long staves of cedar wood and shoots and sticks from oil trees and scraps of flax, which were all tied on the top of the staves with twine. And with these, the court agents went to the top of the mountain, they lit the fire and waved them to and fro up and down until he could see his fellow. And that the latter was doing that on the same top of the next mountain. And so too, this process was repeated in regards to the next person on the next mountain. And then a, a ring of mountain fires would be, so they would witness the moon, and then they would start lighting fi them fires on the top of the mountain. And it would string out and would go all the way to Babylon. This fires on top of mountains, announcing that the new moon was seen. And that's the twinning between the first mitzvah is to watch the, these beings of light, and, and most especially the moon and to hear the, its wisdom of this, these celestial words of the creator. And it's enacted with fire on the mountain, which is similar to Harsina, which is similar to the whole, this whole vision of 
surrounded by water, rock, fire, smoke, clouds. And lastly, this, this sort of state is the, the central meditation of, of, of the Jewish people is this um, vision of surrounded by this oblivion of sea, of meaning coming out on the rock, of receiving Torah on the top in the, in the form of fire, in the form of information with the clouds on top. And that's like the Har Sinai moment. And you're meant to have that Har Sinai moment when you turn for guidance at any time. So Ben Azai was sitting and expounding and fire, and this is the last source, which is 25. And fire, not the last source, this is the last one on the sheet. <laughs> and Ben Azai was sitting, it's just the fire is not seven, not, it goes million, it just, is so much quotations, but I'm trying to curate it. And as I was sitting and expounding, the fire was blazing around him, and they, his disciples, came and told Rabbi Akiva, and as I is sitting and he's teaching Torah, and fire is flying around him, Akiva went to him and he said, I heard that you were sitting and you were telling Torah, and fire was burning around you. And as I said, yes. So Rabbi Akiva said, perhaps you were engaged in the Hechalot, of the of, of, in, in, in the in the in the Merkava of Yechezkel's Merkava, the chariot of seeing all the world being as as one being operating. So Ben Azar replied, "No, I am sitting and stringing words of Torah from the Torah to the prophets and the prophets to the writings, and words that are joyous as the day that they were given from Sinai, and they are as, as sweet as the essence of what was given, and the essence." that was given that day on Sinai, were they not originally given in fire? And the mountain burned with fire. So he's saying that what is the fire? It's, I'm stringing together these words. And so that is the concept of the Torah Kaduma and the Torah as it is in this world. So the Torah as this world is this sort of, as it materializes into an artifact, but the Torah Kaduma, meaning the higher Torah, the ancient Torah, the old Torah, is actually just letters. They're not in the order of a book. They're constantly shifting and moving around, and they don't have meaning. And that's also one of the Jewish meditations, which is that you have words that you say of meaning, but then deeper meditations, you're just actually saying what possibly could be understood as meaningless letters, but they're actually ascending higher and higher and higher until you get to the very top of that, where they're just letters that are just going, they're just sort of like shimmering, and information is just wa is waving back and forth. And it's like, it's not discernible to the human mind. So in that state is the Torah in its like unformed state. You actually have the thing of Moshe Rabbeinu writing the Torah, but he has to write the last moments that happened after he died. So it says, and one, there's many explanations to it, but that he put the letters down, but they were still in the state of the Torah Kaduma. And so in the end of the Torah, they were like, they were just moving all around. And then as he died and then was buried and taken to his people, and there was, uh, he was, and it was known that he was humble and those last few words, as that happened, they came, they came, they came into shape. They told the story. It, fi it finished off the story. So that's the state that we're in. In other words, at this exact moment, there's a Torah Kaduma, there's the ancient Torah, which is this information that is behind creation, and it's shimmering like fire. And in every step that we take, we're determining the way in which that information will come down. What is the story of my life? What am I going to do? And it was always going to be that way. <laughs> but you're the one that is bringing those letters onto the paper. So if each one of our lives are like a story that is being told, or if all of our lives are a singular story, we're the ones bringing those letters down and, being, and as we move, the story is being told. And so the asking for guidance is, is, and looking to Torah is to say, show me what always will be, right? Show me the, what always will be. Like when you turn in prayer in a yearning to say, what should I do? I don't know what to do. I don't know which way to turn. You, you always were going to turn the way you're going to turn. You always were going to do that. The question that you're asking is, show me it, show me it, so that you 
can bring down those letters of fire and make them like into material existence. So I give everyone whatever blessing I can that we should have our light, our eyes illuminated with fire to be able to see the information behind this material world and be able to know which way we always were going to uh, go. And that we should um, know that the, the, that the creator that can't be seen is always there with us. Um, and I don't know, maybe it's even like a, a good chalice. <laughs> maybe, maybe we'll have another, another one, I don't know.